reason I made this Sir Thomas More painting is that I never had given a birthday gift to my oldest brother. He is an expert on Sir Thomas More. I wanted to do something special for him, you know, this one gift that I was going to give him. I'm an artist and I've made a million paintings and um, I decided that what I would do is make him a reproduction of the most famous portrait of Sir Thomas More, which is done by Hans Holbein. And the original resides in the Frick Collection in New York City, which he has gone and seen. It's a portrait that was produced in the 16th century, and of course it was done from a sitting of Sir Thomas More, who sat with Hans Holbein. Um, and that particular portrait is the most important portrait that was ever done of Sir Thomas More. There's a certain irony in the relationship I have with my brother, and there's also this parallel. My brother has uh, done a lot of different things in his life. One of them has been uh, to be a politician. He's been a representative of Mexico's uh, government. He's been elected to office. In addition, he was appointed by the president of Mexico as the subsecretary of transportation. And then he was also the general director of Capufe, which was the, the head of all the uh, bridges and roads in Mexico. And so um, he has this background as a politician. And I, of course, have been an artist all my life and I studied art and it's how I've made my living. So the parallel is that you have Sir Thomas More, who's the politician, who's recognized by King Henry VIII as a very important uh, statesman and who brought him in, to, uh, in for his council. And uh, he was a member of his court for quite a long time. Thomas More, had a relationship with Holbein, as well as Henry VIII did, because Holbein would paint uh, portraits of people in Henry VIII's court, as well as other statesmen, and he also painted portraits of potential wives of King Henry VIII. But there's that relationship of the statesman and the artist, and um, Holbein the artist, and uh, Sir Thomas More, the statesman, and so that I think it's an interesting parallel between my brother and I that he is a statesman and I am an artist. We find ourselves these many years later paralleling a relationship that perhaps um, existed between Holbein and, and Sir Thomas More. In Mexico, we have different groups that are called Thomas More Group or Thomas More Society right now in seven or eight cities. And what we are doing is we're promoting uh, uh, Thomas More life and works in order to prepare young people for a better uh, service to others if they want to become a politicians. What we are founding, Thomas More Life as a model for uh, political life and good citizenship. And I think this is important. And we are doing the same and promoting this in, in Mexico, giving conferences and publishing uh, you know, papers and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, activities. Mm -hmm. I went to a school that was a very fine school, one of the best schools, the San Francisco Art Institute. So what I did is on my own is I would go to museums and I would just look at these master paintings and then I would go back in my studio and in between making crazy abstract and cartoonish kind of paintings I made replicas and uh, inspired paintings by Renaissance painters from uh, the different museums that I went to. I became especially interested in St. Thomas More when uh, the Pope John Paul II proclaimed him as patron of uh, politicians and uh, uh, people uh, related to public service, government officials, in, let's say. So that was the 31st of October of the year 2000. It was a big ceremony in the Vatican and Rome, and politicians from all over the world came to receive the message, message and to receive this, uh, you know, like, like a gift that was given by John Paul II to people uh, working in that field and also offering a kind of a model, a kind of uh, a guide on how to proceed on public life. He 
was a lawyer and uh, he was a judge. He was a teacher. Uh, so he got a lot of activities. Actually, he was a trade representative in some negotiations at that time between merchants from England and, and Europe. But also he was invited to participate in some public matters by the father of Henry VIII and then by Henry VIII. So he became a member of uh, parliament and then he was the speaker of the house and finally he was elected uh, chancellor. He was the first chancellor ever, not a member of the uh, Catholic hierarchy. He has a lot of proposals in different areas of uh, public uh, matters. He has proposals in education, he has proposals in, uh, in the administration of justice and uh, diplomatic relationships and uh, poverty and a lot of uh, areas. Uh, he never uh, written a, a book with, about his uh, political uh, uh, platform or political philosophy or political proposals, but it's in several books, mainly in Utopia, where, where are included all these uh, ideas. And finally, uh, when he was elected uh, Chancellor uh, of England, the equivalent today to Prime Minister, he resigned uh, months or years, years uh, after he was uh, elect, appointed by the, by the king, basically because he was against a law that the king was uh, proposing to Parliament and was approved for, to Parliament. But uh, Thomas More said that this, that was against his uh, conscience. So he preferred to obey his conscience than, than to uh, get uh, driven by his convenience. So that's why he was accused as traitor mm -hmm. and finally was executed in, in, in the year 1535. Hans Holbein was considered one of, if not the very best portrait painter of his time. His work is superb and he made countless paintings while in the court of Henry VIII. His father was also a painter, but he was much more accomplished than his father. His work is just precise and beautiful, and when you see it, you can't help but be in awe of what he's done, and with just oil. I mean, it's just, you're just suspending pigments, you know, the specks of pigment within oil and it and you know when we oil paint it basically you're spreading out those pigments which makes it more translucent or more opaque or you're tightening them up and using more pigment and so it, it really is a magical medium but also to be able to master that and to be able to use it to reproduce believable light and fool the human um, eye into believing that they're actually looking at something real is quite a feat and so this has been a long tradition. Again, even now, today, you will find uh, students going into museums and sitting there working on replicas of master works. Uh, almost everybody knows Thomas More from your literature and history classes in, even in high school. Thomas More uh, stated very clearly is that the education is a lifelong activity. All the time you have to be educating yourself, preparing yourself, learning more. Learning is an everyday activity. There's a long tradition of artists making replicas of Renaissance paintings. For one reason is that the Renaissance represents the uh, one time period of art history where there was this explosion of knowledge and visually um, all these things came about. With the Renaissance, of course, came this discovery of gravity and science with regard to perspective and uh, also um, the knowledge of the anatomy being studied extensively and us also being able to create light, a believable light. That's why, you know, artists have always looked to the Renaissance as like this time period where all these great paintings were made and so they were worthy of being replicated. And it was a tool for a lot of students to better their painting skills. And, uh, some paintings are just so beautiful and so amazing that artists were kind of drawn to making uh, replicas of them or using them as a... Um, inspiration for producing a piece and so and so this painting follows in that tradition that 
Holbein was one of the greatest portrait painters of his time, this particular painting that he did of Sir Thomas More has become pretty much the, the most famous painting of him. Number one, because it was done superbly, and number two, because uh, all these other artists after him have used it as the uh, inspiration for them to produce their own replicas. So many, many, many portraits of Sir Thomas More have been produced using this painting as the basis of it. The New York and the Frick collection is one of the I mean, most important pieces in the collection. And, uh, this is a classic, uh, you know, portrait. Actually, uh, has been uh, it has been uh, I mean, developed into a source. There are some other graphs and uh, designs and some other type of work related to Thomas More, but always associated to this uh, this uh, portrait. For instance, there is a tunnel uh, when you arrive, when you get out of the underground, the subway in London, to get into the into the Tower of London, where uh, Thomas More was uh, made prisoner, there are uh, like uh, murals in the tunnel, and modern murals. And uh, the, the name of the murals is the, the most famous people in London Tower. And one of them, of course, is Thomas More. And if you see the paint, the, the mural, which is you know an abstract type of mural, you notice immediately that it's related to this uh, Hobbling uh, work. So the whole work being a classic portrait of the 16th century has become a reference to some other artistic de development. Of course, not of this quality and precision of the work you have done, but some other uh, you know, abstract uh, designs as well. I'm excited about finishing the painting, finally, after so long of uh, working on it. One little side note is, is that Originally, when I started this painting, I did a head and shoulders version. The painting had a couple of problems with it. The first thing is, is that I thought I would make it different for him, so I did the head and shoulders piece, which was a crop of the original Holbein work, and I used my personal palette, which included colors that weren't used at that time period. And then after I had come close to finishing that painting, I realized that it wasn't good enough. And I realized that, no, you need to make an exact replica of the Holbein work. So I produced a new um, canvas and a board that this is done on wood uh, that is the exact size of the original Holbein work. And I also secured uh, some paints that were from that uh, time period that had the same colors of that time period, which I felt were really critical to doing uh, the replica, uh, specifically an earth green that Holbein used. So uh, once I did that, and then I started on the second piece, and I produced that co that composition, I was really happy because I was like finally on my way to producing what was to be perfect replica of the Holbein piece for my brother. So I'm very excited. And he came in at this kind of three-quarter um, stage and seen it and was very excited, kind of thinking that it was done. And I was like, no, it's not done uh, because uh, there's just this little bit more that's going to be done to the piece that takes it to this level where it becomes believable and yet unbelievable at the same time. So I'm excited to finally reach that point and to have the finished uh, replica of the whole pie piece for my brother. Well, I think it's, it's a happy uh, uh, coincidence and I feel very pleased uh, of that, that when you learn of my interest in, in, a, in a person, uh, Thomas Moore, you investigate uh, things about him and you find out that uh, this uh, Hoblin uh, uh, portrait, which is a classic portrait of St. Thomas More, uh, was also interesting as a, as the, as the masterpiece uh, uh, made by an artist, okay? So I think this is a very uh, you know, nice coincidence that uh, uh, Moore is known for some people for his portrait, right? And some people know him because of what he has done. So. Uh, this is why my interest and your interest came uh, together in, in doing it. And I, I appreciate very much your effort and your talent dedicated 
to, uh, to do this uh, work on Hovland's uh, portrait, but uh, I think it's uh, very interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.